Hi guys, welcome to today's talk. Um, today we have the pleasure of welcoming Brian and Jason. Um, Brian is a graduate of computational and systems biology uh, at MIT, and he graduated this past May with a PhD, and he's now a postdoc at Columbia University, and he collaborates closely with the Institute for Protein Design. Um, he's also one of the co-organizer of the, the seminar series. Um, and Jason uh, is a second year PhD student at MIT who's also collaborating closely with the Institute of Protein Design. Um, and today they'll be presenting their work on diffusion modeling for uh, protein backbone generation. So you guys can take it away. Great, thank you for the uh, introduction, Jody. Uh, yeah, so as Jody said, I'm Brian uh, and I'm excited to be presenting this work on diffusion modeling of protein backbones for the motif scaffolding problem. And in this talk, we'll, uh, yeah, Jason and I will be arguing for a probabilistic machine learning approach to this and describe how we can adapt diffusion models to attack it. So uh, the biochemical function of most proteins is imparted by a small subset of residues that we can call a functional motif. And accordingly, a common workflow in computational protein design consists of two steps. So the first, which we call motif identification, we identify these residues. For example, in the context of a uh, 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 binding interaction, this, uh, this motif might be two segments from different native binding interfaces. <clears throat> then in the second phase, uh, we take this motif and design the rest of a complete protein that holds this motif stably in place, or scaffolds the motif. And as those of you who saw uh, Doug Tischer and David Jurgen's great talk a few weeks ago, um, you may remember, a host of different uh, protein design problems uh, can be put into this framework with motifs with different functions coming from various sources. So for protein interactions, right, we might have binding interactions from fragment docking. <clears throat> In the context of uh, enzyme design or metal sequestration, we could have a, a catalytic site or metal binding site uh, where the motif here could be coming from quantum chemistry calculations. And the third application uh, for vaccine design, <clears throat> we might have a motif that's a fragment of uh, a viral protein that we want to present as an epitope to the immune system and come up with a, a new scaffold to present that, that motif to the immune system. And while there's a lot of work that uh, remains to be done in this space of motif identification, here in this talk, we're going to be focusing on the second stage uh, of mo motif scaffolding. So what makes this, this problem challenging? So it's been said that in the post alpha fold world, protein design is essentially now just a game of guess and check. So uh, like, shouldn't this, this make the problem easy? Well, a naive approach then you might think uh, could be to just naively guess a bunch of different sequences. But a clear problem with this is that like the space of sequences and correspondingly the space of, uh, of all structures that you could get with even just a 100 residue long protein is really massive. <clears throat> so we could think of like visualizing this massive space in two dimensions with this uh, kind of big empty black space here with the, the structures containing the motif is just this very near infinitesimally small sliver highlighted in green. So if we're just randomly guessing different sequences, we're probably not going to find one that has the motif. So a second strategy uh, that's been, been used in the past and had success for some problems is to use native, uh, native scaffolds, um, like so the structures of native uh, like natural proteins, which you could have from the PDB, or now with the alpha fold, we have the predicted structures of, of millions, millions more. <clears throat> but here we run into the challenge that even with these many millions of structures, again, because the space is so large, they'll too sparsely cover. And for most interesting uh, like motifs, we might not have uh, any native structures that uh, are, are close enough to, to being able to house a motif that we care about. Um, there's, of course, been a lot of recent machine learning work <clears throat> in, in advances that, that uh, we're excited about helping this problem. But for the, the tools that exist so far, most of them are either struggling uh, to provide uh, more than just a, a small amount of diversity or have uh, often prohibitively high, high computation cost. It might not even finish running in a, in a tractable amount of time. So to try to confront these challenges, the approach that, that, uh, that we've been uh, developing and working on involves two different steps. So in the first step, we learn a, a model of protein structure from these uh, native proteins, native protein structures that I'm going to call uh, P theta of X. So here we can imagine this model, if, if we're learning it well, we'll be putting mass um, kind of clustered around uh, all of these, these natural protein structures, but ideally additionally 
also spreading some additional mass out um, in generalizing away from the data uh, onto other structures that could uh, stably exist, but aren't uh, in this, this established existing step. Then as a second stage, um, we're going to attempt to design scaffolds around a motif uh, by conditionally sampling. So by this I mean we first think about partitioning structures into two pieces. So the motif that I'll write as uh, X sub M and the scaffold that we'll write as uh, X sub S. <clears throat> and then uh, in this, this second stage, we think of using the conditional distributions implied by the model over scaffolds given the motif. So this is uh, P theta of X sub S given X sub M. And <clears throat> what we'll show is that, uh, yeah, uh, we've been finding that diffusion generative models in sequential Monte Carlo are key tools for uh, attacking uh, each of these, these two steps. And uh, yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll show that these methods have potential to build long and diverse scaffolds with smaller and more predictable computational burden than previous methods. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna start off um, <clears throat> with this, this first segment of learning this, uh, this probabilistic model of protein structure that we call protdiff. And for this, we're going to begin with some background on uh, diffusion generative modeling, <clears throat> um, and then go into how we've adapted this for this uh, problem of modeling protein backbones. And then uh, describe uh, the performance of the model and some of the limitations that we found. And then in a second part of the talk, We'll talk about the second challenge of how do we um, obtain conditional samples of scaffolds given the motif and why conditional sampling is really the right way to be approaching this problem as opposed to a more naive approach to in-painting. Here sequential Monte Carlo is going to be the critical uh, critical tool and uh, I'll show that uh, this provides exact sampling in a large computation limit. And finally we're going to close with a discussion of some limitations and related work in some future directions. And uh, with that I'll pass it off to Jason. Um, thanks, Brian. Uh, so I, say I, I can't see the questions. So if there are any questions, Brian or Barry, feel free to interrupt and stop me. Um, okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about protif. Um, we'll, we'll first give a background of what protein, uh, sorry, diffusion models are, and then we'll talk about how we've adapted them to work on protein backbones. Um, I'll also say that uh, I took some of the uh, slides from the tutorial that happened earlier this year at CVPR. There they gave a very in-depth tutorial and uh, description about diffusion uh, models. So um, if anyone wants to learn more about them, feel free to go and check them out on their uh, website. So um, if you've been on Twitter and uh, just typed in machine learning, um, you've probably seen diffusion models already. They've kind of popped up all over the place within the last year that they've achieved state of the art in image generation as well as text image generation. So in a text image generation problem, what happens is that you give it this text prompt and the model kind of magically knows how to interpret it and generate these images that look very closely to kind of what the text is trying to say. And so these are kind of two very prominent um, success stories for diffusion models, DALI2 from OpenAI and ImageGen from Google AI. And you can see that the images they do are uh, very accurate and um, very high, high quality. So by the success of diffusion models and images, um, one natural idea is kind of what other domains do they really want on? So um, we'll first talk about kind of the general idea of uh, diffusion models. So one way to look at them is that you want to have a way to go back and forth between the data and the noise. So this is made up of two components. The first component is the forward diffusion process that iteratively um, adds noise to the data sample uh, until it becomes completely noised at the end to the right here. An important aspect of this is that this noise process is fixed as in we kind of control how much the scale of the noise that's added is really important uh, for how diffusion models work. Second part is the reverse process that is the denoising process where you iteratively remove the noise that was originally added in the forward process. And this is kind of what we call the generative portion of diffusion models where just kind of given a sample of pure noise, you're trying to extract or transform it into something that looks like the data that you want. So to get more detail about the forward diffusion process, um, first, we set up a predefined number of steps. So that's what's given us capital T here of how many times you want to add noise to your data to transform it into the noise. And each kind of step you take is parameterized by a transition kernel of Q of XT given XT minus one. And you notice that this is a normal distribution that's parameterized by two things. The first is this beta T that defines how much noise is added at each step. 
So this beta T at the very beginning, it's quite small. Um, in the original uh, Jonathan and Hope paper, this was about uh, 0 0.0001. And then as you get closer to the noise, you start adding more noise. And the purpose of this is that you want your final um, distribution to end up becoming something that's completely uh, like a, something completely noisy, something like the standard Gaussian in the image case. Now, the flip side of this is that you take one minus beta T. You can imagine this as um, a, a scalar of how much signal should be kept. And so that's why if you look at the mean parameter of this normal distribution, it's the square root of one minus beta T times the signal that was in the previous time step. So once you've kind of set up this um, transition kernel, um, we know that uh, uh, the way we set this up is that it's a Markov process. So uh, the, the distribution at time t only depends on the um, random variable at time t minus one. So we can break up kind of this uh, very big joint over all t's into just um, a, a cumulative product over all the transition kernels. So this, this makes the, um, the joint distribution a little bit easier to work with. However, uh, in training, we want to be able to sample from any t arbitrarily. And this is uh, quite prohibitive for uh, very large T's because then you'd have to unroll the sampling procedure out and have to do ancestral or autoregressive sampling. And that, that just slows down training a lot. So instead, what we're actually more interested in is uh, the margin of forward distribution, where we want to sample um, the distribution of XT at given at any given t in constant time instead of having to do this ancestral sampling and um, potentially have it take O of big T time. So first, um, let's define kind of this alpha bar t, uh, which, you get, which you see that is the cumulative product of one minus the beta t's up to that point. And so this is kind of one measure of how much signal is kept um, up until that time point. And if we write out what the marginal distribution is of q of xt given x naught, you, you see that um, because also because of the property of Gaussians is that it becomes this very nice uh, form where the mean is kind of the remaining signal starting from the original data points. And then the variance is uh, how much noise was injected at that point. And one reason this also works is because we know what the forward diffusion process is as, as a fixed uh, steps of uh, continuous noise that we're adding. So we'll call on Q of X T given X naught as a diffusion kernel. And if we look at the, um, if you, if you take, think of it as like a Gaussian kernel, sorry, a Gaussian convolution, then uh, this enables sampling from Q of XT. So given this equation on the left here, that Q of XT is the same thing as the marginal over um, the joint of X naught and XT, that the way to sample to get uh, Q of XT is that you would first um, start off with your data point X naught, then uh, sample from the standard nor normal and then just scale it and then this XT is just a, a product, I'm sorry, a sum of those two. So now we have like a way to sample at any given XT very easily. And this is uh, also important for training um, when you want to train on uh, stochastic time steps. So that's the forward process. So now to go into the reverse process, um, it takes a very similar form as the forward process where each intermediate step is also a Gaussian distribution. Um, but instead of kind of starting from noise here, we're starting from something that's complete, sorry. Instead of starting from data, you're starting from noise here, not notably the standard Gaussian, which is uh, chosen for um, images. And our goal is that at every uh, reverse step, you want to be able to match the forward, the forward process of what the distribu distribution was at that given time step. And so this P of theta is something that we need a neural network to learn of how to go backwards, of how to kind of denoise the image and how to um, recover what the data is. And so this P, P of theta also has a similar form as the forward process where um, this normal distribution is parameterized um, by the sigma T, which is kind of how much noise would be present at uh, that given time step. And so um, we're not writing the sigma T out, but this sigma T is closely related to the betas and the alphas that are in the forward process. But what's more important is that we need a neural network that will kind of uh, be trained to figure out what uh, the signal is and learn what this uh, mean parameter is of this reverse diffusion process. So we'll talk about that when we talk about optimization. But um, uh, before I move on, uh, I want to discuss about how you would sample from this uh, from this model. So because of the Markov Markovian uh, property of this process, we can also break up the joint distribution into something that's factorized as starting from complete noise and then taking um, iterative steps uh, through this reverse diffusion kernel. So the, the issue with this is like um, what I originally said that is that 
it would take um, a total of T steps to start from the noise and go to the data. And so because T can range anywhere from 100 to 1,000, depending on the problem, this can be very slow compared to other generative models, such as GANs or VAEs. So that is perhaps one of the biggest downside or uh, yeah, one of the biggest downside to vision models, but there is a lot of active areas of research to speed it up. So to actually optimize and um, learn distribution, um, here I'm just uh, putting out what the distribution want to learn is again. Um, recall that in the forward process, when we talk about the margin of forward, it's this form of XT where you start off with the um, a scale version of the data and then this epsilon term, which is kind of like noise that's added, that's sampled from a standard Gaussian. Now, this mu theta is unrelated to kind of what this uh, x naught is, as then we can kind of arrange the terms and then um, do something with the uh, alpha t um, factors. Again, if you want to learn about the math, go to the tutorial or the whole, Jonathan Hope paper. Um, but the x, but the mu theta is very related to the uh, data that, the, the original data point that you want to uh, recover. So what, what Ho showed and kind of what made these models very successful is that it, this ends up becoming a very simple loss um, calculation. As in, because the model knows, or we know what XT is, all the model needs to learn is how much noise was injected originally in the forward process. So that's why we call this a denoising score matching loss, um, where we're trying to uh, estimate how much noise was added and kind of remove that uh, when we go in the reverse direction. So that is why, um, in this talk and also uh, in the rest of the literature, you'll hear about this epsilon data being called a noise prediction model. So um, uh, diffusion models are a very active area of research, but some intuition about why they work so well um, is the following. One, one is that there is no encoder, as in this full diffusion process, which has um, foundations and stochastic differential equations, um, uh, is, is, is how we're already encoding the data into noise. Therefore, only, the only thing we need to care about is how we actually decode the, the data from the noise. So compared to VAEs where you have to train both the encoder and the decoder, here we're just worried about one side of the problem. And this makes it uh, simpler and perhaps uh, makes it better because of that. Uh, another reason is that compared to GANs, which have a very kind of noisy adversarial loss to train, here we're just uh, training it to predict the noise and get back to the data distribution. And so in a sense, this noise is a lot simpler in that it doesn't have the complex um, optimization that adversarial training would do in GANs. Jason, there's a question in the chat from okay. um, Simon, do you want to unmute? I turned on that ability. Yeah, uh, the question is that when the reverse diffusion is learned, uh, does it sometimes uh, kind of skip steps when it's learned? So say it, it's trained to recover three steps before instead of one uh, one step, or is it always one step? Um, I, I, I can answer be it's trying to recover what the original data was. So um, it's trying to recover like a scale version of going back to original data, original data was. So in a sense, it's like a, it's trying to predict x t minus one really, um, but the x t minus one is closely related to what x naught is. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so getting back to this. Uh, so, so far we talked about diffusion models on images. Um, now, kind of how do we think about them in the protein space? Um, well, okay, so first of all, kind of why do we think they might work on proteins? So one reason is that diffusion processes, um, because they're quite flexible, um, they allow us to model kind of a lot of different types of data modalities. First of all, we can model directly in 3D space and define the noising process in 3D instead of histograms, uh, which a lot of pre-generative models have been limited to. Um, and second of all, they've kind of shown state-of-the-art success in kind of generating small molecules and point clouds, um, uh, given by the two papers, Hu Chum and Luo. And also, yeah, I forgot to mention that um, all the papers that will kind of say at Hall or something, they're gonna be placed at the end. So uh, you can take a screenshot of those references later. So given kind of this precedence, we thought diffusion for proteins would be a good idea. So the first thing um, to note is that Instead of having uh, 1D Gaussians, you, you now have 3D Gaussians of any Gaussian in 3D space. And so um, this is uh, a GIF of how kind of um, you would go back from noise to uh, like a real protein here. And so um, it's, just a, it's just a process of iteratively adding 3D Gaussian uh, noise to uh, what the protein uh, point cloud is. Now, another thing to note here is that in this paper, we decided to stick with just the C alpha coordinates of the protein. Um, and this is because uh, first, 
uh, we want to kind of explore kind of, uh, we'll take it step by step of first mine and see alphas. And then um, in future work kind of get to the rigid bodies as well as incorporating the sequence. Um, the second reason is that uh, there are also already tools to kind of go from the, uh, the C alphas to each of these things, such as protein PNN and alpha folds that we'll discuss later. And then three, kind of um, just coming up with the backbone or the C alpha topology is the hardest part often in protein design. So we thought this, this was a good bona fide effort to kind of um, just focus on a single problem of generating just the C alpha backbone of the protein. Um, so just a little bit more detail about the model. Um, the input we say is like a zero centered um, 3D backbone point clouds. The zero, the zero centered is important because then this removes any global translation and that makes you uh, worry about like the global rotations of the protein. And then um, compared to small molecules and perhaps point clouds, um, we also treat the model as a fully connected graph. This is important for the model to know about long range dependencies. Um, as well as we kind of break the permutation invariance that would be in like a set-based um, uh, graph, graph neural network, where we add the sequential position indexes of each residue. And then we also encode the um, time step. Um, uh, if you read the literature, uh, help, letting the model know about the current time step is on is quite important um, in the diffusion, reverse diffusion learning. So um, one thing that's uh, quite ubiquitous in modeling 3D physical or chemical data is that you want some sort of equivariance in your network that satisfies the five physical and chemical properties of your data. So namely here, we want the model to recognize that if a protein is just rotated, um, that it will treat it as the same, as in give it the same probability um, or same likelihood when it's being sampled. So that's this goal here of P of X naught is equal to P of Rx naught, where R is um, some rotation. And the, the, the recipe to do this, um, was uh, published in a previous paper uh, called GeoDev, but uh, it, it's, it's quite straightforward and quite intuitive. And then if you start off with the uh, invariant distribution to the group that you're uh, concerned with, and if you have an equivariant noise prediction model of how to go, um, <clears throat> how to iteratively go through each step, then your model will end up with an equivariant sample as well. So that's given in this diagram on the right-hand side here, where um, if you just rotate the starting noise, and if you sample starting from that, that you will end up with a protein that's simply a rotated version of what the non-rotated noise would have given you if you started sampling it. And so um, to achieve this E3 equivariance, um, once again, it's just because we're working in uh, just uh, three, the CF point clouds, um, we care about the E3 equivariance. And that's why we chose to use equivariant graph neural networks um, by Satoros et al. And um, the, the, the main property of this is that um, if you kind of rotate the input to this model, then the noise it predicts will be um, as if you just rotated the, sorry, if you rotate the uh, input that wasn't rotated. So that's given by this equation down there, which um, is better to read than me try to say it. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so, so um, I guess one thing to kind of uh, just bring up right now is that uh, we consider with E3 and not SE3. So this model is susceptible to reflections that it can't, um, detect. So we'll, we'll come back to those limitations um, in a little bit. Um, so uh, what does, with generative modeling, it, it's very difficult to evaluate your models. That's why we also spent some time designing or thinking about how to evaluate our samples. So what we came up with was designability criterion, where we say that a 3D structure is designable if uh, we can find a sequence that could fold into it as um, determined by like a structure prediction model. So that's this um, diagram here where the sample C alpha backbone would come from our diffusion model. And then we would use a sequence design method to get the sequence that would likely fold to that backbone and then use a forward folding method to get the full atom structure and then compare the backbones of kind of what we started with and what we ended with with the, using the TM score. And we're, we're calling this a self-consistency TM score. Um, uh, and then if, if TM score is greater than 0.5, then we say that roughly indicates the same structure and that this structure is quote unquote designable. So um, the sequence design and the structure prediction could be um, any method you like. Uh, we chose to go with protein and PNN, modified to only work on the C alpha distances, um, as well as alpha fold two as a structure prediction method, um, except that we don't give it MSAs nor a template. And so this is because we don't want any evolutionary uh, bias uh, in how the fold predicts the structure, as well as this allows for fast inference to um, quickly kind of iterate through designs. So self-consistency um, is not, definitely not a 
perfect metric. Um, the, this is just because kind of our first go of what we kind of proposed in this paper. That definitely was a lot of work. But some just characterization of what self-consistency is doing is that we noticed that if this score is like above 0.9, that means AlphaFold um, really recognizes what our diffusion model would give. But often, more often than not, that this means that there's something in PDB that looked very similar to this uh, design. So therefore, things in this range just kind of shows that the model is memorizing things in PDB. However, what's more interesting is kind of when you go below that into this next category of SCTM that's in like roughly the 0.5 range, where AlphaFold kind of uh, the the, the flat and structure out of AlphaFold doesn't really close well, coarsely matches something that's in PDB, as shown in this uh, middle row here, where um, kind of the AlphaFold prediction has uh, kind of three alpha calices, and then the PDB closest parent um, doesn't have that, but instead is like four beta sheets, but kind of still. Uh, roughly to the same volume or topology. And then things that are um, kind of below 0.25 are things that our diffusion model um, samples that aren't anything that looks like a protein. And so this should be avoided at all costs. Um, so for unconditional sampling, um, we trained with about 4,000 uh, residues. So this is the number of proteins that are less than 128 and are also monomers. Um, yeah, this is a very small subset, but we noticed that kind of going to much larger protein training, a lot more um, pretty kind of difficult in the time frame we had, um, but going to much larger data sets would be every future direction. And as a reminder, this is kind of the um, pipeline that we um, chose to use of uh, ProtDiv and ProTampion and Avalfold 2. And so after we trained the model, we kind of sampled every um, residue length, so up from 50 to 128. And then we calculated the SCTM and then made a histogram plot of um, each of these samples. So we, we made a, a vertical bar here and everything at, yeah, we made a vertical bar at 0.5 SCTM and everything to the right of this, we consider designable um, via our criterion. Everything to the left of it is not designable. And as you can see, most of the density is in this region. So it shows that there's a lot of um, work to do in improving these uh, diffusion models. Um, however, there's definitely, um, some density that's to the right of this. And so we kind of wanted to analyze, all right, out of these proteins that are designable, um, how many of them are kind of novel or how close are they to what is it, what's already in PDB? And so that's what this plot does as, and it's a scatter plot where the x-axis is the SCTM and then on the y-axis is um, when we do TM score with anything in the training sets. So um, we can see that there is a correlation here as in if there's a high SCTM, then it also, most likely has a match in um, something in the PDB, uh, PDB training sets. Um, so what's interesting is if you kind of look at the bottom of this uh, top right quadrant at, that, at things that are designable, but um, are not super related to things that are in PDB. And so we look at one of these, that's uh, the dot in the red box here, um, that uh, this sample that's, in, that's colored, um, the closest thing in PDB is uh, 6C59. Um, that's in gray here. And uh, you can see that there, there are a lot of differences between uh, this, uh, this sample protein and anything that's in PDB. So this kind of demonstrates the ability of generative models to perhaps go beyond kind of what's in PDB um, to get novel protein designs. Now, um, the other thing that we, we showed in this middle plot is that things that have left-handed helices in them, which are not super feasible in nature, so um, should be avoided and is a symptom of the fact that we use EGNN instead of incorporating uh, rigid body frames here. So this is just a depiction of kind of what you see in the samples in that a lot of times you'll notice that there's like a combination of left and right-handed helices, and this is obviously not desirable, as well as some train breaks that uh, often occur. But um, again, it's like it's a first pass of these models and it's an active uh, area that we're looking into improving. Um, another benefit of uh, using a probabilistic general model is that you can kind of try to interpret what the model is uh, embedding of the protein structures. And so that's given here by these um, two um, interpolated samples where you would get two different uh, sampling trajectories and you try to interpolate between them via this um, alpha that's going between zero and one. So like a linear interpolation between a noise. And you can see that um, the model it has like a interesting, a very smooth interpolation of going between two different folds. Um, and this could lend itself to more interesting um, potential avenues or applications, perhaps interpreting kind of um, what like the similarity between protein structures based on uh, the noise distances, et cetera. Um, but yeah, it's just another really cool application of 
these generative models. Okay, um, and with that, I'm going to switch it back to Brian to talk about SMC Diff. Great. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, all right, yeah, so as uh, yeah, Jason's just finished uh, describing, this has been our, uh, yeah, our, our generative model over protein structure, ProDiff. And for this next part of the talk, you know, I can move uh, on to the second stage of sampling scaffolds, uh, condition on the motif to, uh, to yeah, like support, support these motifs. So this is the second stage of the pipeline. Beginning with why conditional sampling is, is something that we think is the correct approach for, for, attack, for tackling this. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this SMC approach in particular. So yeah, in addition to uh, like text conditional image generation, diffusion models have also had like remarkable performance in text conditional image in painting. So for example, in, um, in this uh, example from a, a recent paper from earlier this year, we see uh, first like a, a painting where we can mask out a, a segment of it here with this, um, yeah, with the, this dog in green, and then ask the model to uh, in-paint uh, this image such that it describes a girl hugging a corgi on a pedestal. <clears throat> and yeah, this is, I think, utterly amazing that this, that this works as well as it, as it does. And I think this really like impressive results. <laughs> but when we look uh, closer uh, at the, the, the image, and in particular, um, like the edges along the inpainted versus the unmasked regions, we see some artifacts and, and edge effects, <clears throat> even with these state-of-the-art methods. So when we think about this in the context of protein design, this is actually very problematic because in contrast to like image inpainting, <clears throat> where we can have um, like an overall impression that that is, is quite convincing and, and, and looks good to the eye. Small errors in, in a protein, say we're off by an angstrom or two um, in, in like the distance between two residues, that could like lead to a, a physically impossible structure and entirely break designability. <clears throat> so thinking about this and, and looking at these images, um, you might wonder like, yeah, like, why, why is this breaking? Um, and in particular, I guess I'll, I'll point out Right, some of what we can see going wrong is uh, so that this girl's pearl necklace you see uh, on the left hand side is maintained in the un uncropped, uh, unmasked region. But when the girl's neck is inpainted back in, yeah, this, this necklace is disappearing. And we have these white splotches uh, appearing underneath the corgi's feet. So if we have things like this going on for, uh, for molecular design, this is, this is going to be problematic. <clears throat> but I, I think rather than, than asking, the question of like why why isn't this approach working? A more relevant question is like why is this even even working at all? Um, and our like kind of running hypothesis for this is that uh, yeah, I mean these inpainting methods are working because they're approximating conditional sampling, <clears throat> and that it's the approximation error that's leading to these artifacts and edge effects. <clears throat> so why is conditional sampling the right way to think about this problem? Well, analogous to, to how we had um, like these fixed and, uh, and, and inpainted regions in the previous example, in the context of proteins, right, we can divide the structure in, into these two segments. So it's the motif here in blue and the scaffold in red. <clears throat> um, and now kind of thinking back to this schematic plot that we had at the beginning, in this two-dimensional representation of the space of structures, if we think of describing the, the scaffold portion of this structure on the horizontal axis and the motif on the, on the vertical axis, <clears throat> then our rationale for, for thinking about this as conditional sampling is that if we consider um, this particular motif of interest that uh, I'll yeah, be writing as, as uh, X motif, uh, X of M star, <clears throat> then this, uh, yeah, this is the small sliver um, going a, across like one, one horizontal cut. <clears throat> and if we make the, uh, yeah, the assumption that, yeah, and, and if, we, if we make two assumptions about, uh, about yeah, this, this scenario, where the first is that, like we assume that, that our model P theta is good enough such that it puts positive mass only on, on structures X that are actually designable by the, the criterion that, um, that Jason was just describing earlier. And if we assume that uh, for the marginal distribution of the motif, so right, that's at this, uh, this, this green intersection here is greater than uh, zero for this motif of interest. Then the conditional distribution uh, of scaffolds given the motif is going to be well-defined. 
And it's only going to place uh, mass on scaffold XS such that if we sample those from this conditional and combine them together into a new structure, then that completed structure is, is going to have to be designable. So yeah, for example, you can imagine like we'd hope that this, this red scaffold up top right, might exist in one of these modes of this distribution. But of course, right, this uh, conditional could be quite complex in place uh, mass and other modes as well with this other star say. So again, the, the result here is that if we have a good enough model PX, then motif scaffolding really should be equating with uh, this conditional sampling problem. But this presents a challenge, which is how do we actually obtain conditional samples of the scaffold given the motif? So thinking back to like how uh, generation works in the unconditional case, right, our diffusion model is only telling us how to get samples xt given xt plus one, going back one step by looking at a step forward. <clears throat> but uh, if we were ideally trying to do conditional sampling, what we'd want to be uh, like doing is, is sampling according to the model, uh, the scaffold of the next step, but looking not just at uh, the motif at time t plus one, but looking at the motif all the way back at time step zero, so the unnoised version of that. If we could do this at every single step, tracing through as I'm showing here in, in orange, that would be an exact way to, to do conditional sampling. But again, because our, our unconditional model only lets us do these steps conditioned on all of xt plus one for the motif as well, doing this exact sampling is going to be intractable. So the tractable altern alternative, uh, which I'll describe as the replacement approach, <clears throat> is, uh, yeah, is, is something that we can view as an approximation to this, where um, we, in a first step, apply the Fourier diffusion. So remember, we were calling that Q just to the motif. And then in the reverse process, we're only sampling the scaffold, but replacing, um, yeah, but replacing uh, what, what we would have for the motif with uh, yeah, what we obtain from, from simulating the, the forward process on the motif. But again, right, this is distinct from the conditional sampling procedure in the upper right. So it uh, introduces approximation error, which we believe is leading to these uh, to chain breaks that we, we see in practice. So um, again, kind of taking stock of, of where we are, we have these kind of two different ends of the spectrum. So there's this replacement method that is a tractable but inexact approach for, for in painting. This is what people are using in, in practice. Um, and then on the other, uh, other hand is this uh, conditional sampling procedure that, that would be exact but that we can't actually access. And we, uh, ask then, is there something in between these <clears throat> that could be maybe closer to exact, um, but still be tractable? And we find that, uh, like, in fact, there is a way. Um, and specifically, our proposal is to, to do something analogous to the replacement method, but look ahead by a few extra steps. So at each step of our uh, reverse diffusion for the scaffold, we're going to be looking not only at, at the motif at time t plus one, as in the replacement method, but also at these extra two steps, so t and, and t minus one. <clears throat> and it turns out that uh, using this sort of proposal um, ends up being tractable with the sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. To get a sense of, of why it is that this is actually possible, why, why we can actually get tractability with this approach, we uh, can take a look at this expression of the, the scaffold given, um, yeah, a, a time t given the, the step one, one forward uh, and these three time steps of the, of the motif. But first, just applying Bayes' rule to move these extra two steps for, uh, for the motif in the, in the forward process on the, uh, the left-hand side of the conditioning. <clears throat> and then recognizing that the Markov structure and uh, assumed conditional independencies in our model allow us to further reduce this term uh, into, into two pieces. So the first is the same expression that we can sample from that we have in the replacement method. <clears throat> and then the second is the computable term that we can view as a weighting factor that will be higher or lower depending on how compatible um, our scaffold at time t is with the, the motif a step forward. <clears throat> but how do we use this, this observation empirically? So we can do that with a, with a so-called uh, particle filtering or sequential Monte Carlo algorithm, where this is going to look a lot like the, the replacement method, but instead we're now going to be doing this with, uh, instead of just one scaffold, with a set of k scaffold particles. <clears throat> which I'm going to be denoting here with an additional subscript k for each of the k particles. And with this set, across each of the, the time steps, we have three different stages. So in the first, again, following what we did with the replacement method, 
we're sampling, uh, we're, we're proposing scaffolds uh, xt sub sk from the same proposal for each of the particles. But then we have a, a second reweighting step that uses the sample sca sampled scaffold uh, in, in tangent with the, the motif at time t <clears throat> to produce this, this weight by looking ahead to say, how consistent is this with the motif at a time step t? So from that, we get this weight wk that we then normalize so that across all the particles, they sum to one to uh, another term I'll call w tilt. And then uh, a final step is a uh, resampling for each t, where <clears throat> Uh, based on the weights, we take particles that have high weights associated with them and replicate them by this multinovial sampling. So when double tilts are high, we'll get multiple copies of, uh, of a given scaffold particle. When, when they're low, we might drop them entirely. <clears throat> and with this approach, uh, we've proved the, the following proposition, which loosely, loosely states that if we've uh, learned our, our diffusion model p theta <clears throat> to closely match the, the forward process, in fact, if it matches it exactly, then we have that in the limit of using many particles k, uh, uh, sampled scaffolds from, from this final stage times zero, convergent distribution to the exact conditionals of the forward process that we're looking for. So this sets up a, a computational statistical trade-off whereby adding more computations, simulating more, more scaffolds, the, the computation cost there is going to scale linearly with k, we can get a better and better conditional approximation. Um, but how do, we, uh, how do we then evaluate the, the scaffolds that we produce? So for this, um, we use a self-consistency metric that's very similar to, to the one that, we, uh, that Jason was describing earlier, <clears throat> where we come up with this, this completed sampled backbone, run it through a, a sequence design method or inverse, inverse folding, uh, and then predict a structure and calculate its uh, TM score between the, the initial backbone and our prediction. But now we additionally uh, also look at uh, the, the accuracy of recapitulation of the motif. Um, and specifically, we, we call this the motif root mean squared deviation. And for uh, yeah, uh, a, a number of like, motif scaffolding problems, it's going to be imperative that we get this uh, motif RMSD uh, at or below on the order of, of one angstrom. So our kind of criterion for success here is, is having both the small motif RMSD and a high uh, like, uh, self-consistency TM score. So let's look at this for a, a couple of case studies. So for this evaluation setup that I'll show, we do this with uh, some motifs that we choose from structures in the PDB, because we know that at least one solution is going to exist. And uh, in this case, we have these, these two examples that um, are, are different lengths. So one of them is about 120 residues long and the other one's about 70, each with uh, uh, 20 residue motif segments highlighted in orange here. <clears throat> And in order to, to test the dependence of uh, our ability to, to scaffold them on the length of uh, the, the, re, the, the, the amount of protein that we're trying to generate, <clears throat> we're going to do this for a variety of, uh, of different, um, you know, a variety of different uh, paths around this, this motif, where, we'll, where we will uh, provide kind of additional bits of the native um, scaffold around that motif <clears throat> to make the problem easier or harder, depending on, on how much we add. And we do this because it's been shown in, in prior work that motif scaffolding gets much harder as we move to, to higher lengths. <clears throat> so looking at this first example here, I'll be showing the motif RMSD as a function of the, the scaffold size that we look at as we increase from um, on the order of 30 residues that we're asking the, the model to recreate up to 100. <clears throat> and we find that um, yeah, on, this, on this example, our approach in orange here, SMC diff, is able to, to build diverse scaffolds um, for, uh, for these tasks uh, up to the order of asking for 80 residues of, of motif to be recapitulated. Whereas the, the more naive uh, in painting methods, um, including the replacement method, are failing beyond about 50 residues. So it really is helping in this respect. And then furthermore, when we look at uh, the, the scaffolds that come out of this, we find that they can take uh, really quite different topologies while still maintaining a small motif RMSD. Um, and while the performance degrades more quickly, uh, on the second example, we see that there's still um, across these length ranges an improvement uh, in the, the SMC diff procedure by this motif RMSD metric. <laughs> uh, however, this approach is certainly not a panacea. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so for example, we compared, uh, yeah, we, we, we uh, tried this on additional motif scaffolding problem with the motif uh, obtained from the uh, respiratory syncytial virus uh, or RSV 
neutral neutralizing antibody at site five. Um, so this is a, a motif that we chose because this is recently shown for the first time um, as something that could be scaffolding with a, with a recent non-generative deep learning method. <clears throat> um, and while it was, yeah, this, this uh, alternative approach, which I'll, I'll speak just a little bit about soon, was able to, to solve this problem. Our approach is failing on this in this setting. Um, so we're not, we're not quite there. <clears throat> so yeah, kind of taking stock of, of where we are, I'll uh, kind of end by, by going into a discussion of some related work on, uh, on motif scaffolding and, and generative modeling. So really at, at this point, non-generative uh, scaffolding approaches are really state of the art, but they do have some limitations, which again is, is what we're trying to uh, address and, and improve with these generative modeling approaches. So uh, like a, main, a main approach in this camp is uh, yeah, this, this deep network hallucination, which roughly speaking involves just a search uh, over the sequence space of inputs into AlphaFold. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, because of this kind of iterative nature, repeatedly going through this, this network again and again, <clears throat> this has some issues. So notably, it, it uh, is susceptible to adversarial examples because it's inherently relying on um, yeah, the ability of AlphaFold to generalize away from its training set. And then again, because of the iterative nature, uh, the compute cost uh, is very high for these methods. So it can take on the order of hours to days with, with variable success rate. Uh, a second uh, like uh, non non generative approach is uh, like the the Rosetta Fold missing information recovery strategy <clears throat> that um, yeah it was part of what what uh, Doug Tischer and, and David Jurgens talked about a few weeks ago and this involves a supervised retraining of Rosetta Fold um, <clears throat> to to try to spit out completed scaffolds um, but this is we think in, in part because this is trained in a supervised manner. Uh, provides limited diversity in what it generates and low performance for greater than uh, greater than 40 residue scaffolds. On the other hand, there's uh, yeah, been some really amazing recent progress in, uh, in generative modeling of, of protein structures. The majority of this work has uh, focused on treating distance matrices, uh, like as, as a representation of backbones based on distant matrices as images, and then applying uh, the kind of uh, yeah, more common workflows for, for image generative modeling in the space. And then using a, a non-differentiable uh, second step to fold these things together, which can be a little bit clunky and makes it harder to reason about um, holding part of a motif in place. <clears throat> There's also been some uh, like interesting concurrent work on diffusion modeling uh, in 3D space, but so far uh, no, no other approaches have tried to tackle this problem that um, that we've done for unconditional generation of, of protein structures. So for example, in uh, yeah, this recent work by uh, Anand uh, earlier this year, um, there is generation conditional on the core secondary structure and adjacency of secondary structure elements. In another paper by Luo, um, <clears throat> this focuses on generating uh, just the, the CDR loops of, uh, of antibodies. <clears throat> so against this, uh, this backdrop, <clears throat> Um, some chief advantages of, of PROT diff uh, and, and SMC diff is that it allows unconditional sampling um, of diverse different backbones. And then furthermore, this generative framework allows for efficient sampling uh, up to 80 residues without um, this kind of unpredictable overhead of the hallucination type approaches. So this combination of the ability to, to generate long segments um, and, and having a predictable amount of time is something that uh, is off, yeah, that that uh, together is not offered by either hallucination or the uh, the supervised missing information recovery approach. <clears throat> um, there are some some serious limitations of protip so far, though. So notably, uh, it doesn't yet allow us to extend beyond motifs in the training set. Um, and furthermore, this and, and the other approaches that we've seen require pre-specifying scaffold length and motif placement, which is a limitation. So to wrap up, uh, we showed that diffusion models enable a probabilistic approach to scaffolding motifs um, with these two main components of our strategy. So protdiff capturing a, a distribution over diverse native backbones, and then SMC diff uh, to provide accurate conditional sampling that outperforms in painting on, on scaffolding problems. Uh, this work has been with uh, some amazing collaborators, um, Doug Tischer, Tamara Broderick, David Baker, Regina Barzilay, um, and Tom Yakala. And if you're interested in seeing more of the details, uh, definitely 
check out uh, like this, this paper, uh, here's the, the main reference, or contact me or Jason. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'll show some, some references here. Feel free to, to, to screenshot these um, if you're interested in reading more. Thanks. Brian, there's a question. Do you want to answer that in chat? Oh, yeah. Um, cool. So the question is uh, a clarification. So for the scaffolding generation, does the model take in a structure that shares the same motif with many possible scaffolds from the PDB? Um, yeah. So. I guess for the, the scaffold generation, we're providing in uh, like just the, the motif, yeah, as, as a segment of like a single protein that we've obtained uh, from the PDB. So th that exact structure um, does not exist in, in multiple different uh, scaffolds in the PDB. I, I don't know if that answers the, the question. Oh yeah, thanks. So, so, so you are training on, on just one, protein in that case, where you lo locate the motif and uh, you want to diffuse to generate the rest of the protein? Um, okay, so so we're, we're training on, um, yeah, as Jason was describing before, like a set of like very many proteins from, from the PDB. And then taking that, that one model that was trained on like the set of many different examples um, on... Oh, okay, okay. So you, you train on all the proteins, but you try to use this uh, method you pro you guys proposed to fix the motifs and generate the rest, right? Yes, exactly. Oh, okay, okay. So for the RSV example, so you you train on you know a, a giant data set and then locate the motif and try to generate, and it failed, right? So yeah, yeah. So okay, I think okay. that, that that RSV motif. Uh, yeah, it was was not actually in the the part of the training set that right. the yeah the, that whole protein was not in the training set. So this is maybe part of the reason why it was harder for the model to to do. So I think it's not quite generalizing as well as we would like yet. Yeah. So one question. So if you choose a specific motif, my guess I'm not a biology person, but I would guess that motif will be really unique in the data set. So if you find one motif, that's probably the only instance that you can find in PDB, right? Is that really the case? So I would feel like it's, in that case, it would be really challenging to generalize because you only see one example of that. Um, yeah, so I think it, it depends some, in some sense like on the, the level of precision with which like you are talking about. It's certainly like, I mean, you can get PDB files with, um, yeah, that they, they give you uh, like coordinates of each atom on the order of, of up to like a, a, a thousandth of, um, of an angstrom. And in that case, yeah, like on that level of precision, like a given motif probably will not match exactly anywhere else. Um, but I think the, the interesting question is more like when, when we start asking about motifs that are kind of similar to, to things that might have shown up elsewhere, but aren't exactly the same. Right? We think that if we're kind of distributing the mass a little bit away, then um, yeah, perhaps like that will be, be good enough, especially if there are good, um, yeah, kind of like an implicit uh, like biases and, and regularizations based on the, the model structure and, and regularization strategies that training to allow us to generalize. Yeah. But I, I agree, it's certainly a, a, a challenging problem. Yeah, I think I have a final technical technical clarification. So during training those uh, scaffold generation tasks, there's you're looking at single protein, right? Not not that not looking at complexes. Uh, yeah, for for the two but, case studies that I showed. But um, if you have a complex, it might help, right? Maybe. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, definitely area feature direction. Okay. Um, sorry. All right, thank you very much. It's really cool work, yeah. Thanks. I think Marshall's up next. Great. Marshall, uh, are, are you here? Do you want to unmute? I guess I'll, I'll read hey, it. Sorry, my hands were in a glove box. Um, 
yeah uh yeah i was just wondering i really enjoyed the work it's very cool to read about and, and hear you talk about it i definitely understand it you know better hearing the uh talk than just giving the paper because i'm not a you know, expert in this field but i was wondering you know it seems like one of the big steps in the paper is this part where you take the um you know the predicted structure find a sequence that fits to that structure and then kind of predict it back into the structure space to see like how feasible that whole design language goes and i was wondering you know just it seems to me like skimming through a lot of these papers is that the more things you can put in the model and make it differentiable and have it be a learned process the better the models perform um and that's just my impression i don't like know if that's 100 percent always true but um does that something that you could consider in this workflow or is that like just too complex given the fact that we're using a you know entire alpha fold model and then i think you mentioned like rosetta or something for the uh structure prediction or sequence prediction excuse me yeah this is, this is certainly an uh, area of future direction um so sort of two other works that we talked about so um namara anand who i think I believe gave a talk a while ago she she tried to attempt to do kind of sequence prediction and the three structure generation um in the past as well as one that's just on antibodies um, those works kind of assumed a different problem as in the conditions on something like secondary structure or that the antibody antigen complex was given. So it was a conditional diffusion task. Um, and, and in our experience, like we tried like for a little while to try this, but doing this unconditionally uh, just was really hard to get working. Um, you imagine that you would either have diffusion on each component of the protein and um, getting them all to work is difficult. Um, but uh, I, I think that's a really promising area to go towards like a fully end-to-end -end thing of going from just noise to protein sequence and the full structure. It's also an interesting idea to, to think about like the sequence to structure prediction as a differentiable component as well. Like in some sense, that's kind of like the the driving force, like not at, at training time, but at, at structure generation time in the, the hallucination strategy um, to go back uh, a little bit. Um, but again, yeah, I think one challenge with, with that sort of approach is that, like in, in some sense, like uh, sequence to structure prediction seems to be, to be like a much more challenging problem than generation of structure um, in, in, yeah, for, for a variety of reasons. And, and I think as a result of, of that, it's, yeah, we're, we're kind of, yeah, like limited in, in in the ability of these models to some extent to generalize beyond their their training sets, and I think that there is a risk in yeah treating the, these models as a as a complete or oracle whose predictions and gradients might be yeah something that yeah they, they, they could be something that that I'm not sure that we can count on being very meaningful for for driving the model. So I think that's what at least for me has has drawn me towards thinking of generative modeling just over the the structure as uh like a first step to be treated independently of these other components that tackled this uh what seems to have like a, a clean intellectual separation at least um of, of sequence to structure prediction yeah got it thank you that, that definitely helps Um, we're going to do other questions one by one. Um, so Lame asks, do you have plans to release the code? In addition, do you have experiments on longer proteins? Um, we do, so we're working on an improved version, um, one that kind of moves just beyond just predicting the C alpha backbone. And uh, we think this model will be much better than what we presented today and in the paper. So go to release the code once that's kind of stable and um, working. Um, in addition, we, we have done experiments on longer proteins, but the quality of them were not so good, um, presumably for a lot of limitations that we talked about in this paper. So um, I guess uh, it might be kind of, I don't think it'll be beneficial to talk about those experiments um, other than it just doesn't do much better. Um, yep. And then the next question, what kind of architecture is used to predict the noise? Uh, so we used uh, the EGNN, so the equivalent graph neural network. Um, this is because we only work with C alpha uh, coordinates of the protein. Yeah, I'd also say, yeah, we, we have the details of that in, I think, fairly excruciating detail in, in our preprint. So um, feel free to, to take a look at that if you're 
curious to more curious to see more of the details with that reference at the end. Um, so regarding the C alpha only version of Perkampion, was there any performance cost to using just C alpha versus all heavy backbone atoms in a default version? And then second question, how much of the low SCTM results can be attributed to the step versus regular approach in MPNN? Um, so to answer the first question, um, I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, maybe Brian, do you remember the, the use of the paper more accurately? Uh, I do think there is a cost, like there's a slight degrade in performance, but not much, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I actually, um, if you send me a ping after this, I, I can, can point you towards uh, a figure that the first author of that work has has posted it. It's, it's at least on, um, on Twitter, if not also in, in the protein and PNN paper. But the primary metric that uh, yeah we rely on when evaluating these inverse folding methods, um, predominantly because it's like the easiest metric to be using in, in checking, is like sequence recovery um, on on this like fixed backbone to to sequence recovery task. And there I. I I'm hesitant to be to be quoted on this, but you get about like yeah, it's significant, but not like like detrimental or massive drop in sequence recovery, like on the order of uh, like five or ten percent, depending on on a couple of different parameters. Um, but yeah, I mean, th this certainly I think is is a, a limitation of, of this kind of simplified pipeline of of relying on yeah a, a C alpha only like inverse folding method um, because yeah I mean like we, we do certainly strongly suspect that there are like good really quite realizable backbones that um, that we're not identifying really as designable with our pipeline both because of issues there and then also in in the the single sequence structure prediction step with alpha fold too and again like remembering that alpha fold really is yeah trained only for making structural predictions with a full MSA. So it's kind of remarkable that it, it does anything reasonable at all in, uh, in what we're, we're giving it with just a single sequence coming out of MPNN. So I, I suspect we'd see a massive shift forward, uh, shift to the right on these SCTM plots. If yeah, we had like uh, improved sequences coming out of protein MPNN, either because yeah, from first inferring say the other uh, like heavy backbone atoms or uh, like for their software improvements, but even also on the alpha fold prediction side. Okay, um, the next question is, was motif scaffold prediction never used during training prod diff and only used during inference sampling SMC diff? Um, yes, that's correct. So for prod diff, we only trained on just unconditional generation of the protein. And so this kind of simplified the training procedure quite a bit. So that we don't never had to do a randomized split of the multi scaffold during training, um, and then only during inference sampling we'd reuse this model to do the per, uh, the multi scaffolding. Cool. Awesome. That's that's it for your questions. Um, thanks so much, Brian and Jason. And I guess the contact info is, is up there. Um, just a quick note for everyone who's left. Um, we have a we had to postpone the protein MPNN talk. Um, so that's happening um, I think in two weeks from now. So check our website for the updated dates in the, the updated panel. Cool. Oh, and, and Jody, if you could make me uh, like host, I can stick around for anyone else who wants to hang out after you stop the recording and ask any questions. Yeah, of course, I'll do that.